Welcome to The Drunken Odyssey with John King, a podcast about the writing life. Tell us all news about a man whose mind and career has careened far and wide and upside down, whose computers are seared with crimes against grammar, whose typographical aggressions are legion, whose words flow into the very mouth of time and more than a few bottles. A man who actually owns a typewriter and perhaps even a soul. And now, your host, John King. Welcome to episode 609 of the World's Greatest Writing Podcast. Today's show features novelist Meg Cabot and memoirist Kelly Groom in conversation with TDO correspondent Samantha Nickerson, recorded during Miami Book Fair 2023. Often our combination episodes from Miami Book Fair feature odd pairings. The poet Patricia Smith seemed tickled when her interview with me was joined by my interview with poet Paul Muldoon. And they're both exquisite poets, but very different poets. And this can resemble Miami Book Fair's programming itself. My very first Miami Book Fair experience was seeing a morning panel in Miami Dade's auditorium featuring Clive Barker and Douglas Adams because they wrote in the realms of fantasy and science fiction. Kind of. Sort of. Or perhaps because they were both Englishmen. As one of the first literary events I ever attended, this would have been the early 90s, I cherish that memory in part because of how different those two writers and humans were and how much I enjoyed their work and their time on that stage. Perhaps you'll be surprised at how wonderfully different these two interviews are and be enthralled by the taste of that literary alchemy. And now, the interview of the day. Welcome back, Drunken Odyssey listeners. This is Samantha Nickerson, back with you at the Miami Book Fair, and I am here with Meg Cabot today. What an honor. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So we're here to talk about your most recent novel, Enchanted to Meet You, a Witches of West Harbor novel. And it is absolutely enchanting you know it invokes taylor swift it invokes vampire diaries (laughs) (laughs) thank you yes actually the first time um a friend was in my house when i had this book in there she looked at the cover and she goes is that about taylor swift like enchanted (laughs) i was like no it's not you you look at that that's meg cabin she's like the princess diaries one i was like yes and i'm waiting impatiently to hear back over whether she'll allow me to interview or not so you. Of course. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a little nod maybe to Taylor, and it had the word enchanted in it, and it's about witches, so we had to use it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's smart marketing, but it's also reflective of the content of the book, and the cover is adorable. I love Thank it. you. I love the cover. I was so lucky to um, get such a great piece of cover. And just to let you know, there's a, on the cover, there's a couple riding a motorcycle, and that was not in the original manuscript, but when I got the cover, I was like, okay. Oh, we're really? Gonna, All of the things about motorcycle. Derek? Yeah, exactly. Well, and obviously I went in very subtly and layered all of the motorcycle uh, references, but originally that wasn't in there. So you can get inspired by your cover artist. Absolutely, Especially you can. Especially super late turning in the book, and so you get the cover before the book is done. <laughs> it works great. Derek's personality does scream biker anyways. Yeah. Not like grunge biker, but hot biker. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't think of it right away but it's okay you were busy world building yeah the artist vision helped my vision so the book is about jess the main character jess is early 30s yeah and the beginning few chapters the structure of the book flips between diary entries from jess when she's 15 16 to current day jess Mm -hmm. and we start out with jess at nine years old just a little flashback and she discovers witchcraft exactly yeah. And as a teenager, she stumbles across Goody Fletcher's grimoire. <laughs> and that leads to fun, and it leads to trouble, and it yeah. leads to lasting consequences that exactly. adult present-day Jess then has to deal with, all under the umbrella of like saving her town. 
Right, exactly. She's told that she's the chosen one by Derek, who just shows up one day at her place of work, which is kind of a fantasy. I always had that somebody would show up at my day job and be like, by the way, it's up to you to save the town. <laughs> and so, yeah, she has to use her magic powers and go out there and help stop the evil force. Yes, and she's very, like, cottage witch. That's what she calls herself. You know a lot more about witchcraft from researching this novel than I ever will. (laughs) As Harry Potter fan as I was growing up, this is different. Right. Well, I tried to base it on historical spells from, I think, the 1600s and, like, Northern European Mm. actual spells that were in print. And so every spell that's in the book is actually allegedly real my editor was like did you try any of these do they work i'm like i'm not a witch so i don't know Mm. they might work for a witch but in the book you write that i think i think it's gaia gaia how do you pronounce it gaia i've only ever read it i haven't heard it out loud no until you mentioned it just now i was like wait i don't even know (laughs) how you pronounce it i do that so often so many different words it's like the struggle of a reader exactly and writers yes yes (laughs) I think it's Gaia who says that there is magic in every person and every being, and it's just how you use it, almost how you channel it. Yeah, what your intentions are and how you manifest it. Yes. And so when Jessica's first starting out, she doesn't have the best intentions, and so she gets kind of punished for that. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. Yeah. Can't force somebody to fall in love with you. No, at least you did a love spell on someone without consent. Which is a big no-no in the witching world. So, yeah, she gets punished, but uh, she has to make up for it. So she has to spend the rest of her life trying to make up for this terrible thing that she did. Yeah, and she does feel so bad about it. Always making reparations, always thinking about it. It's always on her mind. Exactly. And it has lasting consequences for her socially as well. Yeah. Her enemy, Rosalie. Yeah. She's her enemy. enemy. Yeah. It's Oliver, a boy who's now a man, who's now a husband and a father. And, you know, will never stop pining, but ultimately is happy. So you mentioned the chosen one. I think it's so cute how that trope just owns itself. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I know it's super overdone, but I love it. And I love any kind of chosen one story. So I had to do my own version. But it's not, she's not totally the chosen one. She has to, she's chosen to help someone else yes. save the town, the bringer of light. So she's not completely super magical herself. Only no. when she's with someone else. She amplifies the Chosen One's power. That is correct, yes. Chosen One, Esther, a teenage witch. Yeah. So cute, so charismatic. And you know what? I really, really appreciated how you managed to capture the adolescent voice. <laughs> it's very girl's girl. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's very sarcastic. She's um, a Scorpio, as she will, as yes. Esther, Esther will tell you. And so she's very practical about anything to do with horror or magic. <laughs> Because she's got a Halloween birthday, I guess. Jess walks into Esther's life and says, hey, sorry, you're the chosen one. And she's like, yeah, I figured something like this would happen (laughs) to me. exactly. (laughs) I've just been waiting. (laughs) And she's like totally on board with it. Like already Matilda telekinetic. Yeah, I was doing some mentoring at the Key West High School. And I had a mentor or mentee who was a little bit like Esther. I'm not going to say she's completely based on her. But um, she was exactly the same way. Nothing phased her at all. It was great. It was so different from when I was a teenager when I was hysterical about everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, not Esther. It's that generation. It's it's yeah. the Gen Z. I'm not Gen Z, but my younger sisters are. Yeah. And I saw so much of them in Esther. Oh, yeah. It was unbelievable. They're super chill. They're so nonchalant. Yeah. I don't understand how. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Same. I don't even. But like you captured her voice beautifully. And then in um, Jess's diary entries, you captured the teenage voice of the early 2000s oh, very accurately yeah. too. So how did you manage that how do you you've been writing for decades how do you keep up with the times like that and like perfect it yeah it's really hard especially when you're writing about for instance that very specific time period 2006 so i did have to do a lot of fact checking to make sure that things i was writing about actually existed then and you know weren't more recent or that she would know about certain things because they had actually occurred so yeah it's it's tough i think a lot of it is spending time with people of that age as i said i was spending a lot of time with some high schoolers But then I also was spending time with people in their 30s. I'm Mm. a little bit older than that. So I just kind of, not copied them, but I tried to mimic their affect a little bit. I think it's kind of a writer's, not curse, but like something that a lot of us deal with on a day-to-day. This happens to me. Tell me if it happens to you. 
you'll hear something, somebody will say something, a phrase, and the sound of it is stuck in your head oh, and you yeah. hear it again. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen to some people. I know, it's crazy. I know. Um, I was listening to a writer talking about, somebody asked him, I can't remember who it was, but they asked him how he knew when he had an idea that was worth writing about and he's like, it just, it bites you like a shark and it mm-hmm. won't let go, which is a very Floridian thing to say, but um, <laughs> it's true, like you get something that just stays with you and you can't get rid of it until you write it down and use it in some way. So mm-hmm. I think that that's a really great uh, analogy. Let's talk more about Rosalie. She's a fascinating character. She's like a mean girl in high school, but she grows up to be powerful. Yeah. Not just in her witchcraft. Socially, she's got, she's a higher economic bracket than um, Jessica, the main character, and she knows it and she flaunts it. And I love the idea of you're stuck in your hometown and then your high school nemesis is obviously somebody you're going to run into because it's such a small town. Mm -hmm. And so Jessica has to deal with that. And I still have some terror of going back to my hometown and running into my high school frenemies, I guess. So that's something that I unfortunately think about. And I don't think you ever get over those scars, but you can grow and learn from it. Absolutely. I think not wanting to run into people in your hometown is maybe a universal experience. <laughs> I think it is. Unless you're someone like Rosalie, who's just been on oh top of the gosh. social ladder the yeah. whole time. And she's mean. I mean, she is a genuinely mean person. And so, yeah, I feel bad for Jessica. Yes. It was kind of redeeming to see her with her children, her Ultimately, daughter especially. yeah, we learn about her. We yeah. learn that maybe there's some uh, stuff going on in her life that uh, makes her a little bit the way she is, but still doesn't excuse it. No, not at all. I halfway liked, halfway hated to see her deceived. Yeah, but you know, she kind of set herself up for that because she's very firm in her belief that you can only have magical powers if you inherit them, Mm -hmm. which is not something that is universally believed, but in the universe of this book, it is by a lot of the witches. And yeah, she kind of gets her comeuppance in the end because like you said, the whole idea of magic is that it is in everybody and everybody, if they have the best intentions, hopefully they can manifest it. Let's hope that her intentions got a little better after she learned her lesson. <laughs> well, we got the sequel. To yes. Find out about that. <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about it, aren't we? <laughs> oh, God, no. That's okay. Yeah, we don't have to. That's funny. Yeah, I wouldn't want to like put you in the spot like that about something that's a work in progress. Yeah, Things can always still... change. But... but I was very interested in the concept of ancestry and, you know, to you because I think everybody wants to find out and I, this is a theme I explore often like in the princess diaries it happened to where you find out that there's something in your background from your family that is incredible and you didn't know it before and maybe you don't like it like finding out you're a princess but um, <laughs> I like to write about people who don't like finding those things out now Jessica's a little bit different because she doesn't have anyone who has any special powers no in fact she's very secretive with her family her Parents don't even appear in the book because she's actively hiding her witchcraft yeah, from them. a 100%, which I think is something that's kind of universal in the teen experience, at least, and the young young person. There's definitely stuff you don't want your parents to know about. And in her case, it's witches, but we all have stuff that we don't want them to... You just don't want to discuss it with your parents. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Uh, you don't want to discuss your witchcraft. You don't no. want to discuss your romance. Yeah, no, not your love life. Oh, uh, my God. And Jess has both of those happening at the same yeah. time here. Her witchiness is growing in proportion to her romantic life which brings us to Derek yeah so Derek mysterious witch not warlock not no. a warlock a witch gender hot neutral, guy. Witch, the, word, the term <laughs> witch is gender neutral is it really yes okay so I mean I'm saying it is I don't know okay. <laughs> I've decided, and a lot of the books that I consulted said that it was. So. Okay, I'm sure. It's a joke within the book. Right. Somebody calls him a warlock, and they're like, hey, <laughs> that's not what you, no. Yeah. You know better. It's like actress, actor, like mm. everybody now says actor. Warlock so. just sounds warty. To, it I know, sounds I don't like, like a like goblin. It. Like, yeah. I, it's not, it's not hot, and Derek is hot. Yeah, I was horrified when somebody called him that, and I was like, oh my God, I got to make sure <laughs> that I put it in the book that he's not a warlock. That's so funny that that was like inspired by a real oh, moment. yeah. So Derek and Jess really hit it off and their attraction is magnetic and it's physical. It's like the stereotypical sparks, but the magic is enhanced and Jess is sent on this like whirlwind thought pattern of is this because of our connection? Is this because he's also a witch? Is it that it's like personal just between he and I? Like what is this electric feeling, this like actual physical feeling that I feel when he touches me? And she talks to her friends about it and they're like, what are you talking about? You're being crazy. Like, that's nothing. 
what was the process of writing that like like writing Jess being confused about it and having kind yeah. of fun with it yeah was that entertaining oh for yeah you? and I think that it's if, especially if you've never really been in love before like Jessica she thought she was but she wasn't you know that's what it's like is that every single breath that that person takes is kind of gives you the chills and uh, she'd never experienced that before so I kind of wanted to write about that and that's what ended up happening but if you're a witch then it's also complicated by the fact that you don't know is this magic or is it an enchantment or is this mm -hmm. really happening and well i won't say it just Jessica, deals but, with yeah all the same self-doubt that a non-witch a modern woman would deal with but extra layers of complication exactly yeah uh, i love jess's cat by the way oh thank you the cat yeah he's um a good boy and i've got i've got a great cat right now that i got from the rescue the animal shelter and um so a little bit modeled after mine but she's a girl mine's a girl much better girls yeah, are better you know. sorry know. sorry I, to all the boys out there <laughs> i've never actually had a boy cat so oh really i don't know what that's like i thought i would give it to jessica i'm not sure what it would be like but yeah. if you ever compare side by side we I can talk they're again all good boys i'm sure okay so another trope that this book explores is another one of my favorites fake dating oh yeah at the beginning they're like oh we're just gonna pretend to date but it's it happens so fast and they're actually falling for each other which is like how that goes yeah but it's like they think they're fake dating but everyone around them is like you're not fake dating the people who are in on it they're like what are you talking about this isn't fake like clearly you like each other yeah. do you see how he looks at you yeah. it's just such a fun like the romance in this book is very like easygoing it's not so angsty it's very like nice to read very exciting you really yeah. root for the characters like you read some romance novels and one or the other is intolerable like yeah, you just can't no. stand them like you've created really likable characters Thank here you. that yeah. was what i was aiming for well you're good at what you do so Thank you all right we're gonna pivot a little bit here and talk about the princess diaries Aww, if you would like to so i am the perfect age to have grown up watching and loving and living the princess diaries oh, actually yeah. i watched it i watched the princess diaries too recently and the princess diaries the first one uh maybe like eight months ago and it was before i even knew that you were going to be at the miami book fair oh. so that's how much we love it i'm one of four sisters so three little sisters and it's just so such a fun story um so magical yet rooted in like realism and it, yeah. just, it seems like it, it would have to have some element of magic for that to happen but that's the charm of your work oh thanks like, of course is Mia one of your favorite female main characters that you've ever written? I mean, I've definitely written most about her of all of my characters, so I feel like I probably know her the best, but I love all my characters the same. Do you? <laughs> Just like your mom loves her kids the same, she says. But no, yeah, I, I love that character, and it was really great to have it that be the one that got made into feature films because even though Disney changes the story quite a bit, and I do get angry letters from people who, when they're reading the books, they're like, wait, the dad's dead in the movie and he's alive in the books. Um, yeah, they made some big changes, but... Why I, would they write to you about that? You know, sometimes when you're a really young person reading a book, they don't understand what mm -hmm. they think, you know, that the book is based on, or the movie, and the movie came first. And, you know, they weren't even born when it came out for the most part. So, yeah, I hear about that a lot. But it's great. I think that it's really fun to have a couple different universes. And just everybody has to remember, mine's the right one. Mm -hmm. But disease is very cute. How is it to have to deal with the fact that it's all canon, even though it didn't all come from you? Well, I think that it's funny because when I write the books, Princess Mia, the character, is aware that there have been movies based on oh. her books, <laughs> are based on her diaries, or her, at least her life story. And she's not happy about it. She's not impressed by the male leads. <laughs> <laughs> common uh, like, common uh, criticism they're not handsome enough or whatever so yeah it's fun to play with but uh, i mean i love it so i it, people think they get confused about what princess mia's opinion is versus my opinion my opinion is everything's great but princess mia you know if you did have a bunch of movies made on you made about your life that you didn't feel were necessarily accurate you might be a little miffed right now they're course. making a third one apparently so i've heard give that her some more material to be mad about will it still be in hathaway <laughs> do you know i hope so yeah we'll see um you know there was the actor strike for so long and the writer strike so that really mm -hmm. set them behind so we'll see what happens it's gonna be tough with everybody's schedules to get yeah. everybody back well i hope that we get to see soon enough thanks yeah 
it was yeah princess diaries is just so good it's such a good girls night movie it is really fun even or, i you know and i don't like reading my own books and i certainly don't like watching <laughs> movies based on them but when it's on i'm like oh it's so cute mm-hmm. so does going back and reading your own book just feel like an editing session yes it feels very terrible and in fact i have such great um, books on tape that have been made from all my books with great really talented actors and actresses and i can't listen to them because it's my own (laughs) writing and i just it freaks me out so no i can't even in the age of the selfie i know it's crazy i just just not it's the writing part that i don't it's okay everybody else can admire you and you I, don't think, have to. I always wonder though i'm like do, how do artists deal with it when they see their paintings on the wall like mm-hmm. i would want to go up and fix stuff because you the artist always notice stuff that's wrong that nobody else does and hathaway was doing the books on tape um for the princess stories for the first couple movies or a couple books and i went in to hear her recording it and i I was listening to her saying the words and I'm like, oh God, they're not good enough. Like I need to rewrite this. And they of course wouldn't let me because it is <laughs> already published. And I was so mad. So that's when I was like, okay, I can't listen to this anymore because I'm just going to constantly want to change it. For my own mental health, I must take a step back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that would be frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I would be able to do it either. No, and even I don't know how actors can watch themselves on the in, on like the big a screen lot of with their don't. giant. Yeah, that makes me happy when I hear that. Yeah, I think oh God, I wouldn't be able to either. I think like Leonardo DiCaprio is a big one. Yeah, I heard Adam Driver like walks out. Oh, if they, if they start showing a clip from one of his movies on a talk show, he can't deal with it. I can imagine I because he that. gets so intense. Yeah, no, exactly. And I don't even know. It's just ugh. No. Did you watch Girls? Of course. Okay. Yeah, I loved it. I cannot imagine being Adam Driver and watching like season one of Girls. Well, yeah. And it's How tough could, because you could yeah, not. You you've could not. developed too as an actor. And so you see things. And I feel the same way as about writing. And mm-hmm. I think every, well, not everybody feels that way, but a lot of people do. So about writing. So as a person, you age five years, you age 10 years, and you think about how you as a person were five or ten years right. ago and you think wow I've grown so much do you see that in your own work have you seen it evolve and do you feel it as it's happening no no I definitely see it in the readers though because like I have so many readers who started out with the books when they were in the sixth grade and now they're getting married they're having kids they have careers so it's even though I don't have any sense that time has gone by I do when I do a book signing like here at the book fair I suddenly realize oh my gosh these people were little and now mm-hmm. they're big and they're contributing adults to the world and it's great well your stories are like good for now these grown women to show their daughters yes and, and that's starting to happen too so yeah. it's really fun that's so special that's something that i look forward to and something that i enjoy doing with my younger sisters yeah exactly so. introducing them to stuff that you love is yeah is the best part now you just hope that by the time they're old enough they're not like ew mom i why know that's it? the danger because <laughs> so many of us don't like what our parents do but my mom was always showing me um you know her favorite movies and books from when she was a kid and fortunately i enjoyed them all so she has good taste she liked everything with audrey hepburn and oh, nice. <laughs> grace kelly and so that started my love of royalty and witches very early on what were some of the books that you read early on so when I was a kid, I loved um, Judy Bloom, mm-hmm. which is great, um, and I still do. And I read a lot of sci-fi and a lot of fantasy. I really liked anything to do with witches and sorceresses, but it had to be women. I really wanted books that had empowered female characters, mm-hmm. um, and that was really important to me. And you found that a lot in genre fiction, that probably more than in contemporary fiction at that time when I was growing up, except for Judy's books, really. So that's what I gravitated towards I loved oh my gosh it's embarrassing I loved Star Wars the very 1977 what? original why one is Princess that embarrassing Leia. well because it's you know it's so old but she was such a radical character for me growing up you know she was ruling a planet and she was saving the rebellion from the evil empire and it was just really empowering and great so well certainly you've accomplished feminist literature oh thank you Uh, i don't know if you know or not because you were already inside but during your reading earlier today uh we were waiting in line i I brought a friend with me we were waiting in line to be let in and line full of girls full of women all ages and only like a third of the line was able to get into the room. <gasps> really? The room was they completely packed. Oh, no. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah. But that's a testament to yeah. how many people your work has touched yeah, and how many people of, are admiring of it. That's so great. Next year, they'll give the they'll give the ladies the bigger room. Oh, they better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Let's talk about Derek's mommy. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a little bit of a spoiler, but oh, yeah. Oh, is it? We don't have to. Yeah, no, they, we should. We can talk about how, um, you know, so many of the romance novels you read, the hero has daddy issues, and I really wanted to have a hero who has mommy issues, but not in the way that he, you know, wants his mom to take care of him all the time. It's the opposite. Mm-hmm. And his mom kind of won't let him alone so um, no she's very demanding of him and puts a lot of responsibility she's a strong woman and most of the guys that i know for some reason have single moms and they've been raised by these strong powerful women and i just wanted to give a little shout out to that because they raised some great guys so derek's mother puts a lot of responsibility on him derek's brother perhaps is somebody he has to cl- go around cleaning up messes after. Yeah, Derek, yeah. It's amazing how two siblings can be raised, you know, semi together, mm-hmm. half siblings, yet have totally different outlooks, worldviews, oh, and yeah. goals yeah. as well. Yeah. I have siblings, and we're all so different. And we were all raised together, but three years apart in age difference. And the youngest one's experience of being raised by my parents is completely different. Than my experience i was the oldest and so of course everything was on me mm-hmm. <laughs> and so i didn't get to do anything but by the time they got to my younger brother they're like yeah whatever go that's fine um so yeah it's really interesting to me that whole idea of um how you can be a sibling with someone who is so completely different than you are because they had a completely different experience growing up and then meanwhile there's jess and ethan her brother and they love each other so much and they're very supportive of each other and thrilled yeah. to see each other and yeah. hey i'm here for you if you need it yeah. oh man you're leaving already like i thought we were gonna hang out Can, <laughs> i just got here exactly yeah I, there's lots of different uh sibling relationships and i think that's a fascinating thing to explore i like the whole idea of the ancestry and family and then you throw in some magic and it's getting crazy Mm -hmm. boom suddenly there's a lot going on and the story unfolds and it's very interesting intriguing i'll be honest i like scarfed this book down it was so much fun oh that's so good to hear yeah on that note we are just about out of time is there anything else that you would like to add on well thank you so much no this was lovely and uh look forward to the sequel yes sequel next book in the series no uh, title yet and uh, not very much plot yet either but it will come that's okay it will come listeners it will come eventually yeah, thank, you. thank you so much for being here thank you for your time Ooh, it was great and now for something that is not the last thing we just did Hello, Drunken Odyssey listeners. This is Samantha Nickerson coming to you from the Miami Book Fair. And today I'm interviewing Kelly Groom about her memoir and essays, How to Live. Hello, Kelly Groom. It's a pleasure to have you on the Drunken Odyssey. Can you tell us a little bit about your memoir? Sure. So, How to Live, a memoir and essays. I have a full memoir, I Wore the Ocean in the Shape of a Girl, that came out 10 years ago that dealt mostly with my 20s. And this particular book deals with four years of traveling. So I had lived in Florida most of my adult life, and I always wanted to write full time. And I received a fellowship to the Library of Congress and a UNLV at Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas, and that started me on the road. I put everything in storage, just whatever could fit in my Jeep, and just traveled for four years. And I had some questions that I wanted to answer. One of them was, where is home and what is it? I'm from Cape Cod. My family's from Cape Cod. Almost no one lives there anymore. I lived in Florida for such a long time. Um, So uh, thinking about that, and then also I was interested in how to live with fear and uncertainty. So I spend a lot of the book doing things I'm afraid of. Purposely. Purposely, yes. Or inadvertently, (laughs) yes. Yes, actually both. (laughs) Starting to do the thing, it goes awry and you realize, oh, I'm afraid. (laughs) Yes, yes. And then thinking about being afraid, I did notice that the the home, where is home, but also fear as a central theme in exploring anxiety and Mm -hmm. depression and alcoholism and trauma. And as heavy as that can be, there is still lightness in this. Yes. So I think a lot of that has to do with setting and action. It's a good balance to the heavy thought. Hmm. So it starts off in Emerald City, Syracuse, New York, in winter of 2002. And there was a passage that resonated with me. 
and it is during a fight. So the passage is about conflict and how it can feel satisfying to indulge that part of yourself that wants to hurt another person. And initially, you know, if the question is where is home and what does home feel like, we like to think home is something nice, home is something easy, but that's not always the case. So do you want to read? Sure. Before we arrive at the gas station in Verona, our gray car parked by the pumps, a thought had come to leave the earth for the lake, to drown in it, step into the water at Green Lakes in my running shoes, let it cover me. But I remembered I'd been a person before all of this happened, before X. I had to save this person. I'd run back to the car. At the station in Verona, I want to hurt him, the one I love, want him to see what it would look like without me. So while he is inside the faraway yellow light to pay, I walk quickly to the restroom outside door without telling him, knowing he'll look for me, see the absence, have a little panic. It may not seem like much, but that intent to hurt the one I loved so sickened me, the turn the Onondaga have a casino in the dark ahead, but from there it was lights to us, or snow, a whole nation inside this one. Before Verona, all I'd felt for him came out of tenderness. As I open the restroom door, I see him bent over the car, over the car door. Maybe he was going to use that sharp voice that is in his, the one he used at the lake, but the car is empty. Thank you. It's different hearing it in your voice than in oh. my own head. Oh. But, I mean, always it is. It's a new experience. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think that we have a tendency to be our own home wreckers. Yes, yes, yeah. But that could be driven from a need. Like, it could be because something needs to change, and you know subconsciously that something needs to change, and you're too comfortable to be the catalyst consciously. But I think that it's a... It's a fitting beginning to this memoir to to start it like that, start it like I'm going to break something. And then from there, we move into Orlando, the city beautiful, mm. uh, New Smyrna Beach, Florida, 2011. And I really liked this one. Okay. It's a person so closed off with a person so sensitive and emotionally open. Like the juxtaposition of that relationship on the page mm -hmm. is just very effective. It hit me hard first one way and then totally in another. It's a very, like, it's got a lot of movement, that one. It's really hard to talk about memoir without, like, spoiling the whole thing. I know, I know. You know, in the Emerald City, there's um, there's this other piece that comes after it. When you talk about, like, why, we, why are we, you know, trying to wreck our own lives? And it says, you know, it's a familiar feeling, this feeling of being cornered and using just some kind of past tools to respond to it rather than trying to figure out something new, like this old, familiar, bad way of responding. Right, well, it's the generational trauma, like you do what you're taught to do or how you learn. Oh, so the moment in um, Orlando and the City Beautiful at the end when the friend wants to marry the narrator and it's a hard pass, but inadvertently in a moment of like in sickness or in health the friendship kind of gives a glimpse into what that relationship would look like in what is it a mcdonald's bathroom we were at oh gosh it's not the pancake house what is it called ihop Waffle? it was oh, the ihop, IHOP. Oh, so close. yeah it was the ihop and they had those towels that the you know the cloth towels mm -hmm. that just like so unsanitary but they just like recycle <laughs> themselves ew <laughs> I've never seen that before. Yeah, they're old. Oh. <laughs> they don't do it anymore. Oh, God, that sounds disgusting. <laughs> but you would just, it was just cloth, and you would wind it, and the cloth would, I mean, it would, you know, it went quite a ways before you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like dry by the time it gets back to you, hopefully. <laughs> wow. Well, there's this image of the narrator all wrapped up in these towels. Yes. Because of a fever, like yes. chills and then hot. And the friend comes in to rescue, and suddenly there is the bride. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's like a platonic momentary marriage, mm -hmm. right? You need somebody so much in that moment because you can't take care of yourself. In the IHOP bathroom. In the IHOP bathroom. <laughs> Honestly, there's probably a lot of caretaking that happens in IHOP bathrooms. 
<laughs> I think that's true. Yeah, yes, yes. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Probably a lot of lonely moments, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I can't get over the fact that they're shared public. Well, I'm trying to think because we just keep going. I mean, I, I, I think it came back around again, or would it just stop? I'm not sure. I have, just, I have this memory of this wrinkly, you know, cloth... <laughs> I'm going to have to Google it. There's what's an what's image it? for your next memoir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Not very germ conscious. <laughs> it's okay. Not everybody is. My Somebody called me out the other day. I didn't realize how bad it was until I was like at Epcot and just constantly using my hand sanitizer. And she was like, are you like a germaphobe? I was like, no. You want some? <laughs> well, since COVID, I think we're all yeah, yeah conscious of it. I was very conscious. I was working in a bank during COVID and never got sick because I was always wiping everything down and not getting sick for like two years and then going back to regular life and suddenly getting sick. I was like, I don't miss oh, this. But oh, yeah. 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 But um, let's move on to The Sky is Full of Horses in Las Vegas, Nevada, January 2012. So one of the moments of lightness that is sprinkled throughout this occurs in The Sky is Full of Horses. Do you want to read this passage? Joe, one of the graduate students, emailed me a time-lapse map of every nuclear explosion since 1945. Beneath the video link, he wrote... Hope this doesn't make you worried about living in Nevada. A Japanese artist, Aseo Hashimoto, made the map. It shows 2,053 nuclear tests and explosions. One is the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. One, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. The rest are practice. The U.S. is responsible for 1,032 nuclear explosions. They appear on the map over Nevada as a series of red blips, like a video game, or like someone is shooting at the map and everything it hits blows up iridescent red. Hashimoto's aim in making the piece was to show the fear and folly of nuclear weapons. So, surface level heavy, but the fact that somebody sent you this map and said, hey, hope this doesn't worry you. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, yes, this is going to worry me. Of course. Like, why would they send you the map in the first place? What was the intention? I had been writing a lot from photographs, and I there was a photograph, I must have mentioned it to Joe, that was of soldiers kind of crouched down, and then in the the background there's a explo- you know there's a nuclear explosion like they seem fairly close to it so i think you know he was just trying to help me with my research uh, <laughs> i don't know if like a joke is the <laughs> hope it doesn't make you worry about living in nevada i was already worried well there's yeah the nuclear stuff in nevada and then moving into like the fracking in the Wyoming. fracking yeah that was a surprise yes so and she used to be an ocean or this used to be an ocean yeah oh sorry this, this used to be an ocean wyoming june 2012 there's a lot about fracking and i actually learned i didn't really understand fracking until this i didn't know it was chemically involved i thought it was just digging or drilling but on the surface wyoming you think big open nothingness peaceful yes maybe some quiet people and that could be true but under the surface of wyoming is basically like chemical warfare on the earth and on the population it seemed to me like a metaphor for a toxic home Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, in Wyoming, you know, there are more ca- cows than people. And, you know, someone mentioned there was a boy walking down the road and everybody at every house called the next person. Like, it's that unpopulated, you know, and it's it was beautiful and green and just all of this farmland. And I was being given a ride into Sheridan by the residency director and everything looks normal and then all of a sudden the land is just completely torn up there's all this detritus and I so I asked her you know what is that and she started to explain it to me which I I didn't realize that you can own the um, the surface rights to your land but most often you don't own the mineral rights which means someone can just come and dig up your land how how yeah well the financial pieces of it, I think, you know, if they find something, then you know you would get some percentage of that. But it's just that's the way it is. That's terrible. It yeah. must be like a state legislature thing because I've never heard of that in any other. Like your property is your property. 
Well, you know, Trump was actually, you know, after this the original draft of this essay, he was selling, uh, you know, the mineral rights, just just a, a vast number of leasable mineral rights in Wyoming. Did he own them? Well, the, the government. Oh, the government, okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought, you know, you say Trump, it's... Is it Trump the president or Trump the person? Oh, sorry, that's true. Yes, no. That's when okay. he was when he was uh, when he was president. Yeah, I actually, you know, when I wrote the essay, and then it had been some time, and then Orion magazine accepted it, and when they accepted it, I thought, you know, I need to really update the fracking because surely it's gotten better. I mean, obviously they wouldn't continue, and it had actually just gotten much worse. Oh, really? Like less regulations? Well, that's what I mean. That Trump was selling had you know just opened up a lot more of federal land to have the, the mineral rights sold. So it hadn't gotten better. So all those people who, in addition to the narrator, now have the question, where is my home because I can't live here because living here is giving me cancer just by taking a shower, all the chemicals in the groundwater. I mean, part of it also is that the fracking is a great source of income for many people in Wyoming. So there's a conflict. Yeah, I yeah. guess you can't really commute to Wyoming. you got to live there if you're going to work there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunate for the people who aren't making that. Unfortunate for, like, the people who work at the gas station, not, you know, doing the, the yeah. fracking itself. But there are many other states, too, that have fracking issues, not just mm-hmm. not just Wyoming. I just happened to be there and saw it, and it was just, I had absolutely no idea. I had heard of it, but it didn't really know what it was. I can imagine that it would be an image that stays with you seeing like firstly seeing the land torn up like that and then adding the context and understanding how torn it is and permanently damaged there's no feeling in the hole at that point i'm part of the research was uh on the earth justice site and they have these maps of they call them fraccidents and so you can look and you can see all of the fracking accidents the fraccidents click on them and find out what exactly was the incident in that place Do you think that there's a lot of like shadiness or dishonesty about reporting those? I think that the the towns have to protect the the residents. So if if you can't run your shower because you know it could the water could catch on fire, you have to you have to tell people. So I don't I, I mean I don't have any research on that, mm-hmm. but from what I've read, it seemed like it was pretty uh, clear. Yeah. Yeah. So on the subject of home in the book the narrator's saying here's the question what is a home the place you left or the place you are now and i was thinking about this and in most cultures except maybe nomadic peoples i i would assume have a word for home and Mm -hmm. live with the concept so why do you think it's so difficult for us to define it and even more difficult to recognize when we're there that's such a great question. When I started the book, and this piece of it is now another book that I'm working on called The Year Without Summer, but my, when I began the research, even before the Library of Congress, I had a, a month-long residency at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. And I was interested in my ancestors, who the Irish, Finnish, and Wampanoag. So the Irish had left and gone to Brockton, which is about an hour or so up the Cape. And the Finnish had gone to Centerville on the Cape, and the Wampanoag had their land taken from them. So my ancestor, Thomas Greeno, was the last surviving Wampanoag in South Yarmouth, and the rest of the, the tribe who were full Wampanoag had died from smallpox, and the town, uh, to pay for that, to pay for their care for everyone who had died, and because he was the last, they called him the last, they took the reservation land that had been held in perpetuity since 1713. So if if the land beneath your feet is your home for the Wampanoag, and your land is taken, like what is home? And for the Finnish, they never went back. Like what what is home if everyone you know, everyone you're related to, is, is you're never going to see them again, and you're never going back. And for the Irish as well, my you know my great grandmother died at 23 in childbirth with her fourth daughter. So I started with them, and I was interested for them, like what what is home? And then that research, I realized that's a different that is a different book. This book is about these four years of travel, and that's a, you know something else. Yeah. Well, 
at some point the narrator seems to more or less conclude that home is the feeling and the memories and the acceptance of love regardless of uh, location or material things and it reminded me of the part in Call Yourself Alive Mm -hmm. when you lose the the ring from your grandmother and quickly move beyond the loss unlike most people most people would probably think about that and beat themselves up about it forever but after a couple of days it's you realize that the love is still there underneath the bare finger and the ring was a signifier but it doesn't the loss of the ring does not mean that the signified is completely gone it's just mm-hmm. up to you now to remember it on your own rather than having a token to prompt the memory and I think that that was like kind of a beautiful moment of homecoming yeah the ring was so important it was so I had actually given a a ring to my grandmother when she was dying to hopefully to bind her to life is what my hope was and but this particular ring it was actually given to me by my brother I had had this scare where I'd had this stage four mass and they were the doctor said you know 50% chance of ovarian cancer and they didn't know until I did the surgery so after the surgery my brother came to visit, and he had read this poem that I had written about giving my grandmother that poem called Ocean Ring, and it brought me this beautiful ring, this uh, a sapphire with diamonds, and he said, this is your ocean ring. In the poem, I said, it seemed, when I was younger, it seemed that when women wore rings, they were loved, and so I would buy these thrift store rings and wear them, and I gave one of those to my grandmother. So it was really the ring that my brother had given me that I lost. And I can't say that I got over the pang of losing it. It was like this one material item that in all that traveling, I let myself want Mm -hmm. that like, I really, I loved it. But yes, then, then I, after a few days, I did come to the realization that, oh, yes, I'm loved without the ring. It helped me just to kind of be in my body and realize that my home is the body. It's, you know, it's the moment, it's the body. So it, it, that did segue into that and help me understand it. Mm. So do you think that home is more um, like your own feeling or part of a collective consciousness? Like, do you think that a person alone in the world can feel like their home? What do you mean by alone? Like Not alone necessarily, like emotionally, like no family left but a person on the road traveling for four years yeah yeah surely there's a lot of constant movement and I think our idea of home it's hard to separate that from like a nuclear family right for Mm -hmm. most people that's like the first thing you imagine even if you didn't grow up like that like that's just kind of how we're told like okay this is your house this is your home Mm -hmm. this is your house the people who live in it are your home yes but yes if you're traveling and you're staying in temporary places or like a residency for a few months right and it's constantly like your home is changing i feel like some people are okay with that some people might have a really hard time with the constant loss of a home or some people could take it as okay I have many homes I can always go back to these yeah, places yeah. back to these people yes I mean there are I, I did come to that realization too that there are many physical homes in this book but you know when you talk about the lightness in the book I mean for me the lightness in the book it comes from paying attention so this just outward looking and that in each place there are just there are these from paying attention and being with people that these moments of, I don't, I'm not sure what to really call them, but they're these transcendent kind of feelings. And I feel like as you were talking that like there, there are these moments of home that, that just happen in that way throughout the book. Connection, maybe? It's connection, it, but it feels very light. It's, um, okay. yeah, it's a, these moments that just really feel like it's, it's more of an underst- maybe an understanding or seeing something. I don't know. But that feels connected to the idea of home. 
it was odd. You know, when I got to Virginia and other places, people kept saying, oh, you're home now, you're home now. And I thought there was these signs, uh, flags they had at Sweetbriar College right across from where I was staying. And I, I would walk there that said, you're home now. It was like this message, you know, that kept, so in your face, so in my face. And I thought, how can I be home? I'm like here for three months. But <laughs> but it seemed like something that I needed to pay attention to that I am home that I, this, you know, it was after I left Virginia that I felt like, oh, OK, so home is actually the moment home is the body. So I think, yes, a person traveling around, you know, without, in, in, as I did in this book, without knowing anyone or knowing any of these places, that you can be home. I didn't know how for most of the book, but the book is really discovery. It's like trying to understand. This could be how to live with a question mark. It's oh. just trying to find find my way. Got it. That seems like one of the people who you learned, at least part of that from, was M. M found home with you. <laughs> M chose you, sought you out, and decided this one. <laughs> I mean, M was a teacher for for me. I mean, I was I was her teacher at an international language school. I mean, her story it was just it really felt like a fairy tale, like a fairy tale with a curse in it. Mm-hmm. Had fallen in love in Japan, was getting married, and her fiance was was in a car accident. And she had a breakdown and was hospitalized. And then, you know, miraculously, she like she fell in love again. She was getting married, and she she said, oh, she was on the side of the road, and her her fiance was leaving, and she just said, I had a bad feeling. And he again was in a car accident, and died, had a complete breakdown, and her her doctor said that her only chance was to move somewhere where she didn't know anyone, where she didn't know the language, where she had to learn everything all over again. So how to ask for a glass of water. And she showed up in Orlando at Aspect International <laughs> Language School, where I was teaching at at UCF. And when she left Aspect, she was also being tutored by a friend of mine, and he left to go to, to teach in Italy. So I so I started tutoring her as well. And that's you know where that story mm-hmm. starts really. So just by chance, finding a person who you have a strong connection with and can help each other you tutoring her or teaching you something about home and what home feels like yeah that was a beautiful story as tragic as her part of it is that one really stood out to me as like a gem within the book I liked it a lot oh thank you thank you well then you know she appears again she appears again you know when I'm at working at Orlando Opera yes yes and it just seems to be this this lesson of like how to go forward, you know, that you can have these like incredibly traumatic events, but, you know, not to be destroyed by them and not to be stuck uh, that that these are the simple things that you do. You know, you ask for help, you, (laughs) you, you, you learn the language, you reach out. But making the choice to do that, I think is even more significant than the learning itself. Making a decision to, to live despite any kind of hardship so maybe that's how to live maybe you choose yeah, the willingness yes. the willingness yeah i like that a lot and with that we are out of time oh, oh my gosh okay thank you so <laughs> thank much you. kelly <laughs> that is the show for this week i would like to thank samantha nickerson meg cabot kelly groom Lisa Pally and Miami Book Fair. Don't forget to check out thedrunkenodyssey.com for all kinds of great written goodness, including perfect advice from Dr. Perfect, heartbreaking comic book reviews by Drew Barth, mad musical recommendations by Stephen McClurg, reviews of extraordinary cinema by Jeff Schuster, who is the curator of Schlock, and musings on formative horror classics by Dimitri Cockney. The Drunken Odyssey also has a YouTube channel with some content not available on the podcast itself, such as the recent discussion of Dune with Dale Lucas, Jared Sylvia, Samantha Nickerson, and me. Until next week, put your ass in the chair, keep attacking those keys, and don't swallow the worm. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. John. Pass me the bottle. Dear listeners, writers, and fellow Odysseans, send your questions, 
observations, complaints, manifestos, transcriptions of Turkish opera, and whatever else you got, to thedrunkenodyssey at gmail.com. A while back, John King endowed the Museum of Schlock and tasked me, Jeff Schuster, with curating the bugger. Each week, I curate one more entry into this proud genre of film. I think. Truth is, I'm really not sure what schlock is, but my writing about it is sublime. Read it every Friday at thedrunkenodyssey.com. Thank you for listening to The Drunken Odyssey with John King a podcast about the writing life. This is your announcer, Lauren Butler.